Hey guys, if you are out there looking for a cool collectible classic vehicle, there are a lot of great options today, but today we aren't gonna show you any of those. We're gonna show you the three that we would avoid at all costs. At all costs. Unless you like shoving a nail through your hand or that type of joy in life, I wouldn't recommend doing any of these vehicles. And I think we have to start with this one. Yeah, so this is a 1978 Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow. And when this debuted in 1965, it was a huge departure from what Rolls-Royce had been doing for so long. And some of you may think out there that this car looks really striking and really beautiful, but look back to the vehicle that it replaced and you will see that they kind of went down a less interesting path. Now, if you look at the predecessors to this vehicle, you're looking at something that's a lot larger. They used to be oh, wider and longer. And back then, they didn't have disc brakes. As a matter of fact, this actually also got independent rear suspension. And Rolls-Royce, they wanted to make a more modern car, which is exactly what they did. However, they built a modern car that is extraordinarily complex. And the complexity is very evident when you look underneath the hood of this. This engine, just looks like a nightmare to me. Everything coming out of these, all these random wires, all these random hoses just look like this has got to be one of the biggest pains in the butt to work on, Nathan. There's more to it than that. And these vehicles were known for having major hydraulic issues, especially with the brakes. Transmission issues were also known, but the amount of money it would take to actually work on one of these vehicles would probably outweigh the amount of money you would actually get for buying one of these things, if it even ran. Yeah, and I think that's why one of the most common things that you will see with these is people literally just yank this all out and replace it with a LSV8 engine, more modern type of uh, braking and suspension system over hydraulics. But at that point, you're definitely exceeding the value of the vehicle. Without a doubt. Now climbing into the Rolls-Royce is probably one of the best parts of owning this. These seats are super comfortable and you can tell that it's using a really nice high grade leather. I mean, this vehicle's from the late seventies and look how well this leather has held up. But not only that, you get these nice cushy center armrests and then acres of real solid wood. And then everything is just like this really nice high quality material from all the switch gauges to the dials. I mean, even the steering wheel feels nice to hold. And then if you look up, this headliner almost looks like it's like a wool fabric. You do have a very comfortable back seat. This comes from the time when you had sofa seats, basically inside of luxury cars because God forbid you be really, really comfortable in a car. That's exactly what this was built to be. And as such, uh, let me just put that right back there. As such, you have a vehicle that is pretty much as comfortable, if not more comfortable than any seating surface you have inside your house. There's a sad reality here because I think you guys will agree with me that this is a beautiful car. It's really cool to look at, it's unique. And at the same time, everybody knows what it is right off the bat. However, people who fall in love with them tend to buy them falling prices that are worth almost nothing. And then they go underwater when they try to fix them. And that's a real issue. Yeah, so I mean, as these cars have gone down and down and down in value over the years, they've just gotten so dirt cheap that the kind of people that are buying them are not necessarily expecting the maintenance costs because this is a Rolls Royce. And although it is great to be able to buy a Rolls Royce, I mean, for something like this in a non-running condition, you can find it for less than $5,000. But keep in mind, you are going to very, very quickly exceed the value of the vehicle. Now, if you are a true masochist and you must have one of these Rolls Royces, I highly recommend you find one with a ton of service records and one that has been meticulously maintained because that is maybe the only version that you could not have problems with. I'm calling Roman right now to see if he's interested. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so if, if you were to find one in really nice shape, you could spend 15, 20 grand. But like I said, one of these that's in non-running condition, less than $5,000, but it will quickly get up to that 15, $20,000 once you start factoring in, keeping it on the road. But uh, Maybe let's look at something a little more common, Nathan. Guys, don't. Do not, don't, just don't. 
freaking don't do it. The SMG transmission in this vehicle will follow you home and it might put a pillow over your face when you sleep. It is that bad, period. Yeah, the, the second generation M6 looks really cool, sounds really cool. I mean, you're talking a V10 engine. Yeah, it's got a V10, sure. With 500 horsepower pump into those rear wheels. It's super cool car. I mean, it's a luxury coupe, right? It's got a big comfy seating area in the front, not so much in the back. You can put the top down so you can drive around, around topless with your friends. But uh, the main running components on these are so, so unreliable that they have like the worst reputation. Terrible reputation. It's kind of funny that he said that there's power going to the rear wheels. There might be power going to the rear wheels if it allows you to. The overall setup for this transmission system was known to be so horrible that even in traffic when they were working right, they didn't feel like they were working right. Also, these vehicles are known for electronic bugs and there are some build quality issues in addition to everything else. So hiding under the hood of this beast is the S85 V10 engine. And a lot of you will recognize this from the E60 M5. And that is where it kind of got a bad reputation. And it really does carry over to this as well because these engines just have so many issues. I mean, starting with the Vanos issues going on. And then if you just look like so many of these components all the way around are just like plastic. And at this point with it being a 2007 are going to be brittle and fall apart when you do want to get into actually do some servicing. I say that anything you call Thanos is bad. Or is it Vanos? Vanos. I still hate Thanos. <laughs> bad. See this? See these? It's part of the SMG transmission. Uh, oh boy, do they have a ton of failure points. The hydraulic pump, the electric motor. I should point out something though. This is a system that you can get a manual transmission in. Yes, with the V10. But they only built 700 of them. But I would look for those because that's the one you want. Less failure points. There's no hydraulic issues. There's no electric motor issues, there's none of that. It's a real shame because they spent millions and millions of dollars developing this system and it frankly is the weakest link on this car. Now, if you're a carbon fiber fan, rejoice because it's everywhere. It's all over the place and this is, I believe, real carbon fiber. BMW doesn't skimp on that. Another thing is that despite the fact that the, this is a relatively tight cockpit, the seats themselves are very comfortable for tall people. So if you're having a hankering for a bangle butt BMW that goes zero to 60 in about four and a half seconds, this may seem like a really good option. But once you factor in the fact that you got the Vanos issues and rod bearing issues under the hood, as well as the many issues of the SMG, this is probably one that I would avoid. I like the wheels. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can find these for pretty cheap nowadays. I mean, you're talking ones like this that have some issues because this one isn't running and driving, hence why we haven't driven it around for you. You could probably pick something like this up, even with under 100,000 miles for maybe $10,000, $12,000. And that may seem like a screaming deal. I mean, how many V10 sports cars can you get for $10,000, $12,000? But you have to factor in repair costs and you have to factor in the fact that every time you drive this, you're gonna be nervous that it's gonna have a catastrophic issue. And I like the wheels. Yeah, okay. Well. Let's move on and bash one more vehicle for you. We were going to jump all over an Audi all road and tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't buy one, suspension, all that other stuff, but we couldn't find it. Then something really weird happened. Brendan and I came to a consensus. We both love old Saturns. They're kind of like unsung heroes. So we decided to change the video. Yeah, so we are going to end this video by being a little bit more positive and uplifting to all of you and giving you some really good buying advice. This is the first generation Saturn SL and this was a true Saturn. Now, a lot of you may think that this is just some rebadged Chevy and you are wrong. This was a true bespoke platform just for Saturn. The people who used to buy these vehicles would go crazy for them. They'd actually have gatherings for Saturn folk. I've owned 
three Saturns in my life, I kid you not. And that's including the one that replaced this, but it had the rounded body panels on it, but they were still plastic. Yeah, I remember going back to the Saturn dealerships when I was a kid, and my mom was looking at buying the Ion, if you remember those. Yeah. And they had the, those weren't quite as good, but they had some of the older Saturns that still had these plastic body panels. I remember they had a door panel sitting on the floor. You could jump they, on it, right? And they told me to go ahead and jump on it just to show the, how durable it was and that it wouldn't dent or crack over time. And these were basically a, a platform where you could get a sedan like this, the SL, the wagon, which is the SW, or the coupe, which is the SC, and they were all relatively the same vehicle. Yeah, and they came with either a single or dual overhead cam four cylinder engine, which is what really made them different. You had your performance version, and then you had your more economical version. You can get them with a five speed manual transmission or an automatic transmission. Well, let's pop the hood and show them. And one of the important things that you guys have to know is the fact that this vehicle was built specifically to compete against. Honda, their Civic, and Toyota, the Corolla. They built this because they wanted an American competitor, and I think they managed to do it right out of the box. There were plenty of problems, of course, because just the quality wasn't quite as good as the Japanese competitors, but these things were robust. They would easily run well over 100,000 miles without many problems, and you had a couple different engine options. Yeah, so this is their 1.9 liter straight four cylinder. And it depends if you got the SL1 or the SL2 or the SC1 or the SC2 and so on and so forth. And basically the only difference was the fact that you could have single overhead cam versus dual overhead cam. Now this dual overhead cam motor put out about 123 horsepower, whereas the single overhead cam was only about 85 horsepower. So that will, neither were a performance machine, but I mean, 40 horsepower is nothing to sneeze at. Not only that, I had the coupe version, among others, and the coupe version, I had the dual, uh, the twin cam, and it got out of its own way just fine. And what was really cool was there was actually aftermarket components available to make the thing even more powerful. And these are really easy to work on and are easy to swap engines. The engines themselves are still out there, uh, you know, obviously used and rebuilt. So a vehicle like this, if you were to buy it for a couple grand and maintain it and then add some components or fix some components, not that pricey. Uh, now this car did belong to a smoker who apparently didn't know how to ash properly. And you can usually tell aside from the seats also with the headliner, what's left of it. This particular example is not what I would call in the best condition. In addition, it had these automatic seat belts, which don't appear to be working right now, where you would clip them in and they would come up and over your shoulder. Not everybody loved those, but everything was really simple in the interior of these things, which I always enjoyed. This setup here, so simple and so basic, and it usually worked. Actually, I do recall, because I grew up in Southern California where I had my Saturns, and the air conditioning system really worked well, at least in the dual cam. Um, one final note is that despite the fact that these are small vehicles, there was enough room for a guy like me, even sitting behind myself, but considering what I'm looking at back there, I really don't want to sit back there. Don't make me sit back there. This car's seen better days. Yeah, this one's, uh... Belts still work. It's a bit uh, shaky though. I'm guessing this thing probably needs motor mounts. Yeah, I would say among other things. But but here's here's the thing, right? These vehicles are in a lot of cases when you go and look for them on the used market, they're going to be a bit on the rough side because they're owned by people that just, quite frankly, just don't have a lot of money and just wanted like a basic transportation vehicle, right? Yeah, yeah, they drive them until they drop them. Yeah, exactly. But they still keep running. They still keep trucking along, even with very little maintenance. They're kind of like older Toyotas in that sense, where it's a vehicle that you cannot maintain, but will still keep going down the road. And I know a lot of people that have had these that are like, well, I'll get rid of it when it dies. And then it just never dies. Yeah. But if everything else inside of it does die, these seats are definitely in need of replacement. So is the headliner. Yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah. It's coming down quite a bit and it's it's a bit shaky and everything, but here, if you bought this car, you could realistically get this for like, what, like less than two grand? And it will get you to and from where you need to go pretty much every time and with very little issue. Because these were just simple, cheap, basic vehicles that there's just not a lot to go wrong with Well, that, that's exactly the point. 
there was simplicity with these vehicles so they actually were capable of lasting a little while despite having people who abused the hell out of them and I just always thought that they were genuinely good little cars that just did nothing special and there's a lot of buzzing in this thing. <laughs> it sounds a bit flatulent to be honest, but it's yeah. It's like an aircraft engine that's actually powering this thing. Yeah. Speaking of which, we are going to take it over here and give it a little light launch just to see whether or not it's actually kept some of that 123 horsepower. Yeah, I mean, these were never fast, but at I least- I thought they at, were relatively quick. I mean, at least at that, you're, you're not dangerously slow, right? No, no, not with the dual cam. Yeah. Uh, no, the single cam, I think, maybe. Okay, here we go. I'm just going to give it a little lunch. Hey, you spun the front wheels. That's not bad, actually. Yeah, she'll move. Um, this one's brakes are okay. But, okay, let's talk about the real thing here. Let's say you were to go out and you were just desperate to get yourself a set of wheels that was basic and simple and that you were either knew somebody who was handy or you yourself were handy. A majority of the problems that this car has can be handled by somebody who's adventurous with basic tools. Yep. This headliner can be replaced with basic tools. These seats can be replaced with basic tools. You go to a wrecking yard, you can replace these components relatively cheap and have yourself a car that'll last you a couple of years and you put very little into it, meaning no payments. Absolutely. So you got a car like this specifically for that. Yes, of course, there's Toyotas and whatnot out there, but those are going for a lot more at auctions. So I think these cars are pretty damn decent. For sure. So I guess the conclusion we've come to, Nathan, is don't buy complex old luxury vehicles and buy stupid, cheap, simple old vehicles. On the nose. And it doesn't necessarily have to be this. It could be an old Elantra or an old Corolla. In some cases, even a Prius. Plenty of old cars out there that aren't particularly complex or are known for their reliability. You're going to save yourself a lot of time and trouble. So, in other words, I think what we're saying is don't fall in love with a car at an auction. <laughs> Use well, logic. Yeah, I mean, and if you do go and buy one of those first two vehicles that we looked at, just be prepared to also have just as much as you spent buying it in the bank, if not more so just to keep it maintained and running on the road. Whereas a car like this, you have 2,000 bucks in your pocket, you're probably good to go for a nice long while.